Welcome to chapter four for human biology students. In this chapter, we discuss tissue varieties. So there are four tissue types in the body. Remember, tissues are just collection of cells that are doing the same thing um, in the body. So we found all kinds of different tissues throughout the different organs. So we have epithelial tissues, connective tissue, muscle tissue, nervous tissue. All of this is domain of histology, which is the study of microscopic anatomy. When you think of Epithelial tissue should be thinking of linings and coverings of organs. So every organ is either lined or covered by epithelial tissues or epithelium, whether internally or externally. Thinking of like skin, stomach, any other organ essentially will have some kind of epithelial cells on it. Right? So these cells protect um, the structures, allow for absorption of molecules and, and so on. How do we categorize epithelial tissue? Because remember, this is histology, so we're looking under a microscope. Whatever we see under a microscope, that's how we're describing it. So if we see one layer of cells here, we call this simple epithelium. If we see more than one layer of cells, we call this stratified epithelium. If we see another different sort of a mixture uh, of cells, we call this transitional, which we'll get back to soon in a few minutes. So simple. Simple essentially means one layer of cells. Stratify means multiple layers. Most of the examples we'll talk about will either be simple or stratified. What kind of cells do we actually have here? If these are flat cells, we call them squamous cells. Squamous means flat. If they're square-like, remember square is a cube in three dimensions, we call these cuboidal cells. If these are tall cells, we call these columnar cells. So squamous is flat, cuboidal is square-like, columnar are tall cells. Uh, keep in mind that all epithelial tissues are avascular, meaning they have no blood vessels immediately in them. Blood vessels have to be located close by to provide diffusion of nutrients through the different layers. They're often found in the connective tissue layers, which we call basement membrane. Basement membrane or basal lamina is a support structure that provides physical and nutritional support to epithelial cells and is really essential to survival of these epithelial cells. Uh, very often also epithelial cells are connected to each other through these different adhesion molecules that kind of bind them together to allow for the overall structure. Keep in mind that again in anatomy, uh, in the study of the human body, whatever the structure is, that indicates the kind of function that this organ will have. Right? So structure and function are interconnected all the time. What about uh, different examples here. So let's say you have simple squamous epithelium. Simple squamous means you have one layer of uh, flat cells. Best example would be the capillaries, the smallest blood vessels, or alveoli in the lungs, uh, the air sacs that allow for gas exchange. Simple cuboidal would be in the kidney. Again, kidneys are organs that filter out blood, removing all kinds of waste from the blood. So the best kind of structure to have there would be this pipe-like structure called kidney tubules, which consists of simple cuboidal epithelium. And simple columnar, another example, this would be essentially tall cells, one layer thick, located in the digestive system where food is actually absorbed through. So in the stomach, intestines, other parts of the digestive tract, we have simple columnar epithelium. Uh, let's take now stratified. Stratified squamous is going to be two examples. One is skin. Stratified squamous epithelium is the skin covered with keratin, so it's keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. And another example is the oral cavity in the mouth, also is stratified squamous cells, except now these are non keratinized. Another example is um, transitional epithelium, the last example here, and this is the, a little bit unusual epithelium that has transitions or changes located primarily in the urinary tract. So if you have urine, let's say in the bladder, and that urine is compressing on the cells, right, flattening them out, that's one appearance histologically. And when the bladder is empty and there's no urine to push on the cells, then the cells sort of bounce back and are nice and plump and round. And the only type of epithelium that does this, they're able to kind of bounce back like that and have either flat or uh, more plump appearance would be transitional epithelium. Again, when you see transitional, you don't have to say stratified or simple or anything, although this is actually a collection of multiple layers of epithelial cells. For connective tissue, um, essentially, we are thinking here, uh, there are many different forms. 
you're thinking of these are the tissues that have fewer cells, right? The epithelial was all about cells, connective tissues. You're not thinking so much of cells, you're thinking more of all kinds of fibers. What kind of proteins do I have here? Mostly you're gonna see type one collagen fibers, sometimes elastic fibers. The collagen is the long uh, protein fibers that provide strength and stability to the organ. Um, if you see uh, loosely arranged fibers on a slide, this is called loose connective tissue, also called areola tissue. If you have densely packed fibers, where they're going to have these, this kind of pink appearance usually, then this is dense connective tissue. And if you see elastic fibers, which stain somewhat differently, these are the elastic fibers that provide elasticity or stretchability to uh, blood vessels, areas like that. We also have different specialized forms. Okay, so uh, this is the ones most familiar to the students usually. So the whole skeleton, bones, cartilage, which is fine and joints, all of this is type of connective tissue. Uh, we're gonna talk about bones and cartilage much more in other chapters. Uh, the most common type of cartilage is the hyaline cartilage found in most joints like elbows, shoulders, and others. Uh, adipose tissue is the fat in the body, right? So adipose sites have very unique appearance on the slides and uh, sort of these kind of outline of cells because the lipid actually gets washed out when you prepare a slide. And this happens to be, again, a connective tissue variety. That's the most important we want to remember here for now, is that which kind of cell is categorized where. And blood, with the red blood cells, white blood cells, and other components that carries oxygen, carries nutrients throughout the body in the circular system, is also happens to be connective tissue. Again, we will come back to all of this later in the semester. For the muscle and nervous, muscle, basically these are the cells that allow for contraction and movement. There are three types of muscles in the body. Skeletal muscles that do voluntary contractions attached to the bones. Like when you pick up an object and you are doing this voluntarily, right? These are muscles that contract and attach to my bones. Cardiac muscle, which is the heart muscle, very unique, right? The cardiomyocytes, heart muscle cells, obviously involuntary type of muscle. And smooth muscle, another involuntary muscle that's found in the digestive tract, urinary tract, and anywhere else in the body where you need to have the movement occurring, but you're not consciously need to control that movement. So thinking about like when you're eating the food and food is passing in your stomach, you're not actually telling your stomach what to do, but the smooth muscle there are allowing the food to move further. Okay. So of these three, the smooth muscle is the most different one. Smooth is the only one that is not striated. Skeleton cardiac is striated. Striations are these thin lines that you see under high magnification on the microscope. And that kind of helps you to remember that there are proteins in that, inside there that do the contraction. And again, uh, skeletal is voluntary, cardiac and smooth muscle are involuntary. For the nervous tissue, you think of the nerve cells and glial cells. The nerve cells are the primary cells that allow for communication. Remember, the job of nervous system is to send chemical and electrochemical messages called neurotransmitters to different cells in the body to control them, to allow them to communicate. And so the most important, the biggest, most complex cells are the nerve cells. Uh, they have the cell body, the dendrites and the axon sticking out and the message transmitted from the cell body through the axon towards the axon terminal and then sends the message towards the receptors on a different cell. Because nerve cells do so much uh, work and they essentially are unable to do anything else because of the very resource intensive and demanding job of sending these chemical messages, we need actually support cells called glial cells to be there next to the neurons to help them function. So glial cells are regular cells in the body that are considered support cells. They provide physical, nutritional, and um, other kind of support to protect and shield and feed the neurons to make sure that they are alive and they're doing their job. Uh, let's talk about now the next part of this chapter, which is talking about the first organ system, the skin. Now, when we're talking about the skin, the skin essentially consists of, uh, this is the largest organ, by the way, in the body, it has three main functions, protection, sensation, thermoregulation. Protection, remembering skin is our physical barrier, shields all our inner organs from sunlight, from wind, from other kind of damaging rays and other uh, substances from the external environment. So protection, very important, important, the key function. 
Second function, sensation. When you're touching surfaces, remember when you have nerve endings that transmit that information, it is thanks to those nerve endings and the skin that we are able to sense whether something is hot or cold or has different structures or painful or pointy or anything else. Okay. And the last function is thermoregulation or temperature regulation. And here we're thinking of essentially presence of nerves and blood vessels in the skin that allows to regulate temperature. So again, protection, sensation, thermoregulation, main three functions of the skin that I want you to know. What kind of layers the skin consists of? It consists of three layers. Top layer is epidermis, underneath that is dermis, and the deepest one is hypodermis. Epidermis, the layer you can actually see, epi means above. That's the layer that is primarily consists of epithelial cells. So remember, that's the stratified squamous epithelial cells, to be specific. And the top layer of epidermis is cornified layer, consists of dead cells filled with keratin. And the bottom layer, the basal layer, consists of mitotically active cells, or those undergoing mitosis or cell division constantly and replenishing the dying cells at the very top. Between the bottom and the top layer is actually many other layers as well. We're not going into those examples. You'll see them in, in the book. Um, uh, you can mem memorize those terms if you want, but they're not very relevant in terms of the naming. Most important for now is to have the general appreciation of what this looks like and what do these cells do. So again, epidermis, you're thinking of these are the primary cells at the very top, consists of epithelium in the skin. The connective tissue component of the skin is actually the dermis, which consists of the top layer with kind of wavy line, that's the papillary dermis, and the bigger reticular dermis. Reticular dermis is the one that consists of most structures. You're thinking of the skin, such as hair follicles, uh, blood vessels, nerve endings, collagen fibers, and everything else that's there making up the bulk of the skin. And now, so hypodermis is actually just adipose, so just fat, so this is kind of a what we call subcutaneous layer underneath the main skin layers. That's going to be the least important for us. The main layers, again, are epidermis, epithelial uh, tissue, and dermis, connective tissue for the main structures. What kind of main cell types do we have in the skin? So the skin consists of cells that produce keratin, keratinocytes. Remember, keratin is the protein that makes up hair and nails and the top layer of the skin, that cornified layer. So keratinocytes, most cells in the epidermis, are keratin and they're producing keratin. And other cells in the deeper layer of epidermis are usually the melanocytes. They produce melanin, the brown pigment that gives us skin color, and even more importantly, shields us from the damaging rays of the sun. So when melanin is produced by melanocytes, it actually disperses throughout all the rest of the epidermal cells and stands directly between the sunlight rays and the DNA in the nucleus to make sure the sun is not striking DNA directly because it will cause mutations and damage to the DNA, causing potentially cancer and other irreparable damage. So everyone has melanocytes, everyone produces melanin unless they're albino or have albinism, where this is a case where there's a mutation in melanin pigment and they cannot produce a healthy one. But everyone else, regardless of their skin type, or the ancestor or genetic uh, background has melanocytes has melanin. The difference that if people have different skin color is that someone who has darker skin produces deeper, sort of stronger pigment concentration and more of that melanin because their ancestors live closer to the equator and their sun, they were exposed to the sun more directly and more damaging rays of the sun. And someone who has lighter skin, has ancestors from the northern climates, has lighter skin again because even though they have melanin, their melanin is produced in somewhat different form and kind of lighter quality of melanin uh, because you need less protection there since the light strikes the earth at a different angle there and it's less damaging. But anyway, the main point here is that everyone needs melanocytes and melanin because this is critical to protect our DNA in the skin from damage of the sun. Other accessory structures in the skin is the hair and nails that we mentioned already consist of keratin. Remember, hair follicles, the root of the hair is located deep in the reticular dermis in the skin. And we have different types of glands like sweat glands and sebaceous glands. Sweat glands produce watery secretions, sweat, and sebaceous glands produce oily secretions to protect our skin, especially found in the facial skin. Sebaceous glands could be discerned or kind of differentiated from sweat glands on histology because sweat glands are uh, could be found in any different area, while sebaceous 
are actually usually close to the hair follicles. Review all of this information, pay particular attention to the illustrations in the textbook.